science in its purest sense is exploring the unknown. And whenever you explore the unknown, there is a chance you're gonna find something that's completely unexpected. I'd like to talk about AIDS. You've been so phenomenally successful in controlling this devastating, horrible disease. And you, among thousands of other researchers, have been responsible for saving millions of lives. But I recall Larry Kramer wrote uh, an article either in the San Francisco Chronicle or Examiner. Examiner. Right front page, you know, I call you murderer, an open letter to an incompetent idiot, mm -hmm. Dr. Anthony Fauci. When I saw that, it was like, Wow, <laughs> you know, holy mackerel. But after the <laughs> jolt of it, uh -huh. I started to put myself in their shoes. So I developed a relationship, a very fond relationship with a fellow named Marty Delaney. Marty Delaney uh, was the founding director of Project Inform in San Francisco. Now, at the time, there was one drug that we had for antiretroviral, and that was AZT. As we turned out, retrospectively, it wasn't good enough, but it was better than nothing because it was temporarily suppressing the virus. Then one of the major, major morbidities and, and terrible uh, aspects of HIV was cytomegalovirus, which has multiple forms, but the one that was most devastating is tearing up the retina. And a new drug was coming out. It was called gancyclovir. But the rules at the time were, if we're gonna test gancyclovir for CMV, the, per the patient can be on no other drug. And the reason is that they wanted to find out what the toxicities and adverse events were with gancyclovir. So they didn't want anybody else on any other drugs. So when I went to visit uh, 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 Marty, he took me to the apartment of a friend of his who was clearly had advanced HIV disease and was on AZT, but clearly had bad CMB retinitis. And he was rapidly losing his vision. And I stood by the bedside and the guy looked at me and, and it was just really, it was really interesting. He said, you gotta understand, I have AZT, which maybe is gonna make me live a little longer. And I'm losing my vision and I need gancyclovir. What the federal government is telling me, I have a choice. I can either get off AZT and die, or not take gancyclovir and go blind. What kind of choice is that? And that's when I went, oh, you know, yikes. And that turned me around. The fact that HIV AIDS can be controlled, you can lower the viral load so that it's not transmissible and it's undetectable. Has that reduced the passion and support for finding a vaccine? No, no, it, it hasn't, absolutely not. One could uh, perhaps surmise that it would do that because the, the success with drugs has been so spectacular. I mean, we never imagined you could durably get the level of virus to below detectable level. Nor did we imagine that once you did that, how people could regain their health. That's different than a vaccine to prevent the 1.8 million infections that occur every single year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a thousand a day in South Africa in the KwaZulu Natal area. I mean, it's just devastating. There are some genetic mistakes that protect some few rare people right. from becoming infected. Right. Yes, Yes, there are. The primary receptor for the virus on the cell is the CD4 molecule. The co-receptor is a molecule called CCR5. So when the virus comes to a cell, if this is CD4 and this is CDR5, CCR5, it just gets both of them and binds. There is a genetic defect, namely complete lack 
of a functional CCR5, this receptor doesn't express itself. So if you are homozygous and don't have any expression of CCR5, you will not get infected. So you will be free of infection, even if you get exposed. So you must have explored the idea of genetic modification through CRISPR. The question is, can you edit the gene? Can you edit out CCR5 by molecular editing, like by CRISPR-Cas9 or not? And we're doing a lot of research to see if that's the case. When PEPFAR came about, given your collaboration with George Bush, that was sort of the most wonderful, yeah. remarkable yeah. event right. in the history of our country. Yeah. When I look back at my life, even though I think my science and the fact that I was a productive scientist in the arena of AIDS and was well known, allowed me to develop that kind of rapport to, to develop with the president the PEPFAR program. But the PEPFAR program was not a scientific thing. It was an implementation of the science. It was money. Yeah, and, and it, to me, it was so striking. I mean, you, you're right. The people who are not fans of George W. Bush find it hard to believe, but it's true. I mean, he sat down with me and said his exact words. For a rich country to have what we have, he said, I find it, it's almost a moral obligation to, to not help people who are suffering merely because of where they live or what their economic situation is, what part of the world they're in. And that's when he sent me to Africa and, and said, go and see if you could put a program together. And the two words he used was, it's gotta be transforming and accountable. I don't wanna be throwing money away and find up people pocketing it and that. I want it to be something that really has an impact. It took months to figure out What's the right countries, the right number of countries, the right amount of money, how would we do it, what would be prevention, what would be treatment, what would be care? Because I told him it was gonna cost a lot of money. At minimum, it had to be $15 billion over five years. The president, to his credit, said, let me worry about the money, just do the plan. And then on January 28th, 2003, at the State of the Union address, he just got up and he announced it. I didn't know that he was gonna announce it until about 48 hours before the State of the Union address when they called me up and said, come down to the White House and let's put together a paragraph to stick into the State of the Union address. And then I said, yes, it was amazing, yeah. Recently, there have been two new treatments for Ebola. What we did in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we did a randomized control trial. We scheduled it for 725 patients and intermittently, the Data and Safety Monitoring Board looks at the data to make sure you're not doing more harm than good or you're doing such good that you might as well stop. Efficacy and safety. Yeah, because it's unethical to keep a trial going if you know what already works. On August the 9th, 2019, two drugs, the Regeneron product and monoclonal antibody 114, clearly were much better, highly significantly better than the control and certainly better than remdesivir. The beauty of that is that on a Friday night when the data were analyzed and the DSMB reported to me and said, we need to stop the study and we need to get these two drugs to anybody who needs it. By Saturday afternoon, the people in the Congo were getting the right drug. Nature is the worst bioterrorist. I think you said that. I have said that. Microbes will always be ahead of us. I believe you said that. Yes, yes, right. So the, the issue is, we have got to realize that we have always had emerging infections from before we were able to historically document them. We are living right now today, seeing that there are emerging infections all around us. Just look at what's happened within the last few years. Zika, chikungunya, West Nile, and now Ebola, Nipah, MERS, SARS. A hundred years from now, when you and I are not around, there's still gonna be emerging microbes. So what we need to do is realize that microbes will continue to emerge as physicians, scientists, public health officials. We have to develop the capability of responding rapidly so that we're not preventing them from arising, because that's gonna happen. We gotta prevent them from becoming public health outbreaks. If we try and guess, I often do this when people interview me, what is the next 
disease X. And I don't have a foggiest idea yeah. what it is. And the reason is because we've never predicted correctly what it was anyway. No one would have predicted Zika. So I want to just try a few things. One has to do with immunization. Does it make you angry that there are people who talk about autism and it's been disproved scientifically, yet they still say... Yeah, very. I've had to deal with that a lot uh, and testified before Congress multiple times about that and with the skepticism of, you know, something got into the uh, literature, which was then proven to be uh, uh, false, fabricated, and debunked. The person lost their medical license in the UK. Yeah, he lied. He lied. He, he totally lied. And yet, it's out there that yeah. the measles vaccine causes autism. But children not getting vaccinated is a spectrum of reasons. In a developed country in which there's easy accessibility, misinformation about the adverse events is one. But there's also a very interesting paradox. And the paradox is that vaccines have been so successful as to take away the fear of infection. So you get parents, usually parents of a higher income status, who feel that they have this, what I call libertarianism taken to the extreme. Why should I vaccinate my child and have a medical authority tell me what I wanna do with my child? Mm -hmm. I wanna make that decision. Well, what they're forgetting is that not only do they have a responsibility to their own child, but they have a responsibility to society yeah. because there are people in society, particularly infants from the time they're born to the time they get their first shot at one year, who are highly susceptible mm -hmm. to getting measles. There are people with immunosuppressed disease, cancer patients who are immunosuppressed, people who have abnormalities of the immune system that they can't take a live attenuate vaccine. As a society, we have a responsibility to protect them. And you protect them by getting the herd immunity that comes with 93 to 95% of the population getting vaccinated for measles. Once you get down to the 70s and 80s, the way it happened in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, then you get the hundreds of cases of measles, which are completely avoidable. A very interesting, sad, and somewhat shocking statistic that's true. We're, we're battling uh, an Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And as of the last count, there were 2,800 cases and about 1,900 deaths uh, due to Ebola in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And there were many more deaths from measles during that period of time. So we're focusing on a scary disease like Ebola when an equally scary disease that we don't put into the category of scary and yet babies are dying of measles in the Democratic Republic of the Congo more than people are dying from Ebola. So I want to ask you one other thing that really interests me it has to do with creativity. Yeah. What you do is highly creative. Right. You're constantly probing the unknown. You're constantly searching for that which mankind has not explored right. and known. So what would your feeling and comment be about this idea of creativity in science? Yeah, well, well, science in its purest sense is exploring the unknown. And whenever you explore the unknown, there is a chance you're gonna find something that's completely unexpected that's gonna lead you in this direction. So the question I'm asking is X about this particular function of this particular disease, and you go after it, and then you find something that doesn't make any sense because it's been unexplored, and that could generally lead to a completely different avenue of, of pursuit of knowledge. And that's the fun part of it. It's always fun to get a plan to say, I wanna discover this, and you discover it. That's the straight line. But what's much more challenging and much more fun is the, the right and left turns that you didn't count on taking. And finally, what are your personal feelings about um, governmental universal health care? You know, I think that strongly that health care is, is, is a right, uh, not a privilege. Uh, I think we have to figure out a way, a mechanism of getting easy, 
unencumbered access to health care to everybody who needs health care. How that is done, I mean, we're in the middle right now of multiple, you know, people coming up with multiple different plans. I'm not sure what the plan is, is going to be, but the bottom line and the end game is that everybody should have access to health care, not whether you have a pre-existing condition, you should have access to health care. If you're a poor person, you should have access to health care. You know, it, it, everybody should have access to health care.